Welcome to Syntax. Today, we are having an episode that is rallying against the $20 a month per user hosting services <laughs> out there. We are going to be talking about hosting your own platform as a service, which is everybody loves these amazing services that you pay $20 a month uh, per user for because they compile your code, they deploy them, they do all that good stuff for you, but they get expensive really quickly, especially now that the VC money is drying up. It seems like everybody is jacking uh, up the rates for that type of thing. So Scott has gone off the deep end and he has <laughs> learned the word Kubernetes yes, and yes. <laughs> lots of other scary things. <laughs> uh, and we're going to take a look at like hosting your own websites, but but even more than that, right? Like Like hosting your own thing that will do the auto build for you right yes absolutely yeah and and we're, we'll be going deep on what some options here and maybe uh some of the pain points that i hit or or just some interesting things uh but if you want to host your own pass without being out on your ass you have to have Whoa. Secu- you have to have software monitoring to make sure that your software is functioning as expected and you know it does a really great job? Sentry. Sentry.io or sentry.io forward slash syntax actually is the new URL for us. Oh, yeah, check it out. Yeah, check it out. You can give them a try. This podcast is presented by Sentry. But let me tell you, if you have any sort of errors that need fixing in your software, and, and let's face it, we all know you do, yeah, Sentry is the perfect tool to help you fix those errors, especially if they're in production before your users have to send you an email saying, hey, the thing's broken. You already know it's broken. You wrote it, but you know it's broken because Sentry told you it's broken. So let's get into it here. Let's let's talk about it. So what what are these things first and foremost? A pass, as you mentioned, a platform as a service. You've probably used a lot of these: Vercel, Render, Netlify, Heroku, um, DigitalOcean's app platform. There's a ton of these things. You know, you kind of get the vibe where you log in, you connect your GitHub, you. Tell it which repo you want it to go. You potentially give it your build commands or where these things are located. Bingo, bango. The whole thing goes up onto the internet with a a custom domain. Then you get a free SSL. You, you, You connect your DNS records to it. You have your environmental variables in your groups. And then you have a website online you didn't have to do anything (laughs) set up to do that you didn't have to manage your nginx server uh or nginx is nginx a server is that a correct way to say that wes yeah yeah nginx is a a web server that will handle incoming requests and do ssl certificates and you're not nginx doesn't actually run your code it will pass it through to your actual your your application's web server but nginx or caddy or apache sits in front of your application to handle in requests. We've done a couple of shows on it as well. Yeah. It's funny. For most of my career, uh, I did use a lot of hosting my own stuff via Nginx or even Apache. And for the most part, I just did what it told me to. They, they weren't necessarily things I got too deep into. Um, but you don't have to deal with any of that stuff because I personally, those, those are the worst aspects of hosting my own code was dealing with that stuff. So along came, you know, I think Netlify was maybe one of the first ones that people tried where you connect and you just get up and running. That was like super duper easy. Or or Heroku even before that. Heroku was maybe a little bit less simple than Netlify. Netlify super simple. And then you had companies like DigitalOcean, Render, and Vercel coming in a little bit later to try to uh, do those in a different way. Vercel's now. I think think Vercel was before. Vercel used to be called Zeit. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure they were before, the, and they used to be only Node.js hosting as well, no serverless, uh, and they, they totally flipped it. And Let me tell you, no I was at Zeit Day when the serverless platform was announced. I spoke Oh, there. yeah. Yeah. Man, history in the making. And we love these services. We joke about them getting really expensive, but at the end of the day, these services, in order to make money, they cannot simply sell you the raw cost of using it. Like AWS, you're paying for actually how much compute you're using at the end of the day. And for a lot of websites, that is very, that is pennies. Um, And it, it, it turns out that charging people based on actual usage is not a very good business model. Um, and you can make a lot more money by charging 
them $20 for everybody who needs to be able to log in per month. And, or just like, like, for example, I'll, I'll pick my, my bone with render is I've been on render for probably th- three or four years. I pay them thousands of dollars a year and they recently switched it from, I log in, I pay for however many servers I want. I can auto scale. So I, I, I say I have two servers at a minimum. I can scale up to five. Mm-hmm. And then the, the traffic that I get, it'll it'll scale up more servers as I need it and scale them down as as I don't need them. It'll load balance it all for me. And then render switched. And now you have to pay for $20 a month just to have an account to turn the button back on. Um, so that's an extra 240 bucks a year for me simply to to do that. And a, a lot of these other hosts are also now going in the regard of like, you just, you just pay for monthly, like N- neon kind of did this, but neon is just saying like, people don't know how much it's going to cost them. Mm-hmm. And if you tell them it's going to cost this much for a thousand reads and writes, like that's a really good point. It's like, I don't know how much, like just tell <laughs> yeah. me it's going to be 20 yeah. bucks a month and then I'll use it. So oh, we understand that as well. Um, but I do feel like the bills on a lot of these hosting platforms, especially if you've got side projects and you're not, of course, people are, people were telling me if you can't afford $20 a month, then you shouldn't be in business. Like, of course I can afford $20 a month to host this thing, but it's the, we're always looking out for the, the podcast listeners and whatnot of like, if you have a little application, it shouldn't run away from you where all of a sudden you realize holy crap, I'm spending a couple thousand bucks to host these side projects. Yeah. yeah. And and so, Wes, it's funny, you touched on a lot of things I had in the why section in your in your uh, little rant there. And and we'll go back to some <laughs> of that stuff. I really appreciated okay, that rant, though, because I, I agree with you 100%. Before we get any further on the what side of things, I do want to define Kubernetes here for the average listener. This is not for the Kubernetes professional. I don't need your well actually is about this. Um, it's basically a control center for managing containers of applications you've all used these services where you can hit plus on a a container to scale it horizontally or vertically those types of things you can add more resources quickly you can uh, add more containers you can have multiple of them that are you know fault uh tolerant so if one goes down you know they're sent to the next one this is kubernetes not not saying that every time you've used that it's Kubernetes, but this is what Kubernetes does. It handles okay. scaling, fixing, sharing resources, making your applications more resilient. Um, uh, can I ask a question for the listener? How is that different than Docker? Docker has a thing called like Docker Swarm. Maybe? Swarm. Yeah. Yeah. It's I don't I don't I don't know the intricacies of why it's different. It's very similar. And it it functions in a similar space. In fact, when I was learning about um, one of the services, Coolify, um, when they weren't using Kubernetes, they suggested using Docker Swarm as an alternative. So I I would love for what? We have a a guest coming on, David Flanagan coming on. Yeah, yeah, he's going to talk to us about this. Let's put that on the big old list of questions for David because um, that's not something I know the intricacies of. Okay, so the, the thing I was asking about, like, a Docker container is a single instance of a virtual server that is running. Kubernetes architects not Docker containers, but it architects multiple containers, containers so yeah. it can it can scale them up and scale them down and uh, do all that good stuff. We're not again, we're not Kubernetes experts, but that's how I understand it. Yes, and that, and I think that's mostly what you need to know when we talk about Kubernetes as a concept in this episode. It's like, hey, you know that interface that you've probably seen where you can scale up or down an interface. Like that's that's it's not the interface itself, but that's really what the concept of working in Kubernetes is. Um, so as you mentioned, it's really like death by a thousand services here, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I I host a lot of side projects in. One thing that you used to be able to do very frequently, Heroku used to get like five free um, dinos, I think they called them. Uh, many of these services, Meteor, when it launched, had a free like hobby hosting plan. It used to be free to throw up a node server somewhere and not have great performance or anything, but just as a proof of concept. But obviously, just like a lot of things, crypto miners have ruined that experience for most of us. So 
we no longer have that many uh, places where we can just go quickly throw up side projects. And many of you are left with maybe paying seven bucks a month or something for a node server for some side project that you don't even care about, you just want online. And, and, and so to me, like you've mentioned, like, yeah, you could toss these things on, you know, pay per usage situations. But sometimes you just want a server to dump a bunch of stuff on, you know, uh, and you want it to be able to be performant and work well and actually, you know, be much yeah. cheaper. Yeah, I, I miss the days of I still have a PHP server. I, I was laughing the other day is that I have a, a Bluehost PHP server and I'm not hosting any of my own projects. <laughs> I have my dad's website, a couple of his clients, exactly. my wife's website, and I was like, man, I at at the at the time, at the the height of my WordPress days, I was freaking running like forty apps on a single like a six dollar a month PHP server, and that was the best, you know. You just throw it up there, and even for like lo the longevity of the web, like uh, people say, oh, just throw it on Netlify or whatever, and I love Netlify, but the time will come when Netlify realizes yeah. we need to make more money. And what are they going to do? They're going to say, we're making some changes to our free tier. And the, this is the way that it happens. This happens at all of the places. This is how these companies get people on board. It is they have VC money. They give away lots of free services. Everybody gets it on there. And then Subsidized they pull the pricing. rug out from yeah. under you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. I think that is a big concern here. And, and I think one of the things you even mentioned about like WordPress hosting, right? We all host WordPress sites in, in maybe some of you want, right? Maybe you're all working on application development, but I still host WordPress sites. And if people ask me, where's the best place to host a WordPress site? I don't know, like a uh, Bluehost? I know you hate Bluehost. It's not Bluehost. Like, don't, don't use I, Bluehost. No. I know. I said Bluehost because I knew it would uh, get a reaction out of you. You know what? Uh, I went to one of your old videos because the Syntax YouTube channel, you should subscribe. I was like, I was like, well, I wonder what, like, what are some old videos on this thing? Because it, it's the, the, we changed the level up tutorials YouTube channel to Syntax one. So I went back to like one of the very first YouTube channel and it's little Scott saying, oh, yeah. hey guys, uh, you could get a blue house for three bucks a month. That was the yeah. price way back yeah, then. Yeah, it, it was. It was not only that cheap, but they paid me a hundred dollars yeah, per mention I, per sign up. I made bank on the blue host referrals for many made years. Made bank on it. Yes, yeah. I know. And, and honestly, I did host a lot of stuff on Bluehost, so it's not like I was just hucking it. Um, but yeah, me too. Either way, you know, like you want to host a WordPress site real quick for friends and family. They need something. What are you going to tell them to do? Pay pay seven bucks a month, pay fourteen bucks a month, or you can get a one click install with some of these services. And and so we'll be talking a little bit about some of these services in just a second here. So uh, maybe hold on hold on your horses just a little bit. But in in reality, your app shouldn't have to be bringing in money <laughs> if you just want to throw up a side project. And, and I think some of the people who might hear this, like hosting your own stuff on your own virtual private server but i i like all my my things my um ssl certificate stuff i like my um auto deploy on commits yeah, i build like my pipeline preview urls and stuff like that well check it out a lot of these services do exactly that some of which do so in a very nice ui some of which do so just on the command line or some of them just through configuration files but you can get the netlify experience for anything node apps wordpress like think about it this way you could have your own server you could do a one-click spin up an app right a pocket base a redis a, a mysql all on your same server in just a couple of seconds and connect to it private privately under like one cost which to me if i'm working on a bunch of projects that's super compelling because why well i might not want to pay whatever the extra service for a private service on render to host a redis service for my side project but i still want redis and i still want a cache for it well now i can just add it to my already existing server under those same resources and i think that's like a, a 
a very compelling reason to potentially add some of this stuff because if you do want to add any of these little services it adds up and even if it's free to start you have no idea if it's going to remain free once you start adding things like this yeah i i don't know i i found it to be pretty compelling and the thing i was scared about most was losing access to the the niceties i had from those platform as a services but it, it turns out that you can get all of that and i will say off the jump if you have any platform as a service that are either open source paid or the type of thing that you can host yourself i'm interested in hearing about more of these because i have a list of several of these uh kubero coolify cap rover doku piku kuber and acorn a bunch of words there, right? Ooh, they all sound like Pokemon. They do sound like Pokemon. Which of these sounds the most like Pokemon? Caprover probably, or probably Doku? Do, Piku? Do, oh, Piku. Doku. That's like a Star Wars thing. Piku. Yeah, obviously Piku. Cuber sounds Cuber. like a Mario. Cuber does sound like a Pokemon though, too. And so does Kubero. Honestly, all of these could really pass yeah, for Pokemon. Kubero sounds like the. Oh, dude, you Wes. got a Kubero. Wes. Here is a game for our uh, live show, Pokemon or yeah. web service. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Kubero. That's okay. All right, we're adding it. Uh, by the way, React Miami, we're going to be there. So maybe we should add that to React Miami. You should grab tickets to that right now, everybody. If you would like to play Pokemon or web service, it could be a continuation of one of our fan favorites is a... Uh, <laughs> What, is yeah. it? what do we say? It's like a NPM package or uh, a thing or both. Yeah, NPM package or uh, th- that was it. it was like, is this a carbon fiber road bike or a NPM package for maintaining dependencies? Yeah, that was perfect. that was a really funny one we did. We should do That's that one a, again. One of my favorite segments because writing it is just as fun as experiencing it <laughs> with the audience. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's get into these players. There, there's a huge yeah. amount of variability in this world. Some of these contain UIs. Some of them contain uh, just CLIs. Some of them have paid add-ons. Yeah, so a lot here. Um, so these services that you're going to go through, these are not like a SST or a flight control, which is, these are this is not software to deploy to AWS, or maybe it is actually. Um, these are just like like literally run your own server. It's not serverless. It's not scale up and down. It's just something that will you go and get a server somewhere, or like I'll walk into my server room and I have a uh, a little disk station Synology running there, right? Like I could install these on my Synology and literally host it in my house if I wanted to. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And in fact, there's there's a lot of people that do do that. But you can also just install these on a VPS somewhere. I've been seeing a lot of people talk about installing some of these on ARM. Seems to be like a big topic. There's not a lot of cloud ARM 64 hosts. Oh, like ARM, you mean like like the processor that's in the MacBooks and in Correct. Chromebooks and your phone probably? Some people are even offering hosting on a Mac specifically. I think it's like using Mac Minis or something, but... That's usually pretty expensive. If you if you use GitHub, um, GitHub Actions, and you want it to run on a Mac, it's like ten times the cost. Yeah, and and I think that's why people are going with with ARM. What's interesting is that like Hetzner kind of seems to be the the cheapest best option there, but I found them to be kind of awful to work on. And in you know a lot of people really like them, so I'm not I'm not talking trash about Hetzner, but as a American, it, like literally asked for blood of my firstborn child to get signed up with a, a cloud account there so and i don't mean literally literally, literally. i know that's a, a trigger for some people um so you can host these things in a variety of places of which can be very cheap you can host them on a DigitalOcean droplet and get going in no time now i'm still a little bitter about the css tricks thing so i might be looking at other places to host but a <laughs> Uh, a shared ARM64 based CPU starts at four pounds a month. For or no, those are euro. Sorry, that's the euro symbol. It starts at four euros Classic a American. month. Classic American. Yes, I know. For that, for two <laughs> CPUs, four gigs of RAM, forty gigs of disk space, and twenty terabytes of bandwidth. So that's really reasonable for an ARM server. Um, and so again, you can doesn't host cost an arm and a leg. Places. 
It doesn't cost an arm and a leg. Does it cost 64 arms? Yeah, oh. that's good, Wes. That's good. Like that. That's good. I like your arm and a leg joke. Um, okay, Kubero. Let's talk, let's talk about Kubero. Based on the name, you might be guessing this one has something to do with Kubernetes, and it absolutely does. Uh, Kubero is basically a self-hosted Heroku alternative. It uses material design from 1998. I know that didn't exist then, but it uses the old school material design <sighs> aesthetic. And it honestly, I, 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 I'm trying to be nice to a lot of these. They're open source software. But unfortunately, this one like does a lot of cool things and would be very nice. But it does look like it was clearly designed by engineers. So if you're the type of person who yeah. requires a uh, fancy UI or a UI that is you know, doing a lot for you, you know, this one's maybe not for you. It, what it, is that about material design? How every time I hit a material design app, I'm like, oh, this thing's going to suck. Yeah, like, well, why? It, or or is it just, is it just tired? Is it a tired it's UI? It's tired. Yeah. Even Home Assistant uses a material UI and I'm just like, Ugh. I like, I liked material when it came out and that yeah. was like 10 years ago or something at this point. That's yeah. wild. Uh, it came out a long time ago, and so I think that's really just it. Is it just looks old, and that's fine. But this this thing is really easy. There's like uh, really quick add-ons to get going with just about anything you want, and that's kind of the thing you're going to see from a lot of this stuff. Like if you want to spin up a Rabbit MQ or a Redis or a MongoDB, it's like really super easy to oh, do. Oh, so, so you can throw your databases in there too. Bro, you can throw anything in here, and most of these have like one-click services to do so, um, which is fantastic. Um, so a Kubero is certainly an option. I don't think you need to get too deep into Kubernetes. It's it's basically you're just using a either a curl command to install it. You're you're logging in. You're getting going. This one is Kubernetes based. Again, I, I don't think you need to know Kubernetes to use this. Uh, Coolify is the one that I've been seeing suggested the most and is the one that I've used the most out of all of these. Uh, Coolify.io, in my experience, has the best UI of any of these. Um, what you'll see is a lot of the really high powered ones or the really interesting ones are all either CLI or configuration based. But if you're like me, I like logging into my Vercel dashboard and seeing in the red and green um, indicators if something's failed to deploy. <laughs> I like clicking on that and looking at the logs there. I don't want to do command line for everything. And so that's really where I think Coolify shines is that the um, UI, even though the CSS is in flux, the uh, creator has mentioned that it's it's in flux right now. It still looks yeah. really good compared to most things out there. It feels modern. And for the most part, it feels like using a Vercel type of situation where, again, it's not like a serverless platform. But when you you connect your GitHub, I have my GitHub connected. I then get to see all of my repos. I select the repo I want. I tell it my build command. I click go, and it has the exact same style of tabs interfaces. All right, you got your ENV variables right there. You got your build logs. You have automatic deployment on push. You have SSL in domains without having to do anything to set it up with. It like automatically gives you the SSL, just like any of these things. And most of these platforms will. Let me be clear about that. But you do get that experience that you might be more used to with this and i think the the thing that i really liked the most about it is that i was able to get up and running on a coolify instance in yeah. like 15 minutes or less so i i spun up a droplet on DigitalOcean. i ran i right ssh in i ran a curl command i logged in i created my account connected my github deployed my site really oh you you take out half those steps and it's the same as any other platform as a service, right? And so Coolify, I'm just looking, they have a pricing page. This is something that they host themselves or you can host it yourself. Yeah. Like so I think there's it's, it would be like you're using render versus hosting render yourself. Okay. Okay. So if you do pay, basically Coolify is the controls. Regardless of what you do, you bring your own servers. But Coolify is the controls for architecting and and controlling your your actual servers. And you can either run it, run the controls on their server for five bucks a month, or you can host the whole open source part of Coolify as well. Is that right? Yeah. 
Yep. And yeah, what, and what the, are you are you paying for the controls, or did you actually install Coolify on the DigitalOcean droplet yourself? I installed Coolify on the droplet myself, and it, it okay. was one. It was a one com- It was a copy and paste a command, hit enter, and then log in. And then, but you sent me a URL that had Coolify in it. I, I thought, oh, he's paying for something here. Well, yeah. How come the URL has Coolify in it? I don't know. <laughs> I, they, I I have since moved that off of the uh, domain. Let me even check that because I I've assigned that an actual domain now. Let me even check what that domain was. It's probably doing some like um like tunneling similar to how like an ngrok or Cloudflare tunnel works, where it, it gives you an external DNS and it knows how to tunnel to your actual server in case there's like a what's the word where network traffic can't get in? Why am I blanking on this? A firewall. firewall. <laughs> in case there's a firewall in the way. Yeah, firewall. We haven't heard that term in a long time. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know where it's getting the domain. I just clicked it to generate a generated domain, which I probably shouldn't have done because I think it automatically saved that generated one. <laughs> and um, what's interesting about it is it's it's like some weird generated string. Then my I, dot my IP address dot sslip dot io. So who knows what's going on there? But you know, once I I just copied and pasted my actual domain in there i pointed my cloudflare to it based on the dns instructions i was given and it just worked so you know i didn't have a um i don't know i had no issues getting up and running with my domain on it or even just getting you that quick little domain which connected again straight to to my box here so yeah i found coolify to be really really nice and and to give you like just a generalized idea man if i want to spin up a WordPress site, for instance. I come into my Coolify. I select the project I want. I click New Resource, and then it gives me a big old list of resources to install. <laughs> Do you want to install uh, MB on here? Do you want to install a ghost blog? Do you want to install MySQL? Just click it. It deploys it, gives you a URL for it, and you can connect to it privately. Man, that's great. I got to say, it's, it's super good. That seems good. nice. And one of the cooler things about Coolify, too, is that, yeah, you can do like a Docker swarm with it so you can get that, that you know, oh. more, more secure. Or, or, so it's not just like, it's not just a toy for hosting side projects. You could use, you could host your whole infrastructure on this. Yes, you could host your whole infrastructure on this and you can specify which server you want any of your services to run on. So even if you have Coolify running on Droplet A, you could spin up a Droplet B and without even doing anything other than connecting the two, within Coolify you could say, hey, deploy this app to Droplet B and run it on Droplet B so that way it is always going to be in its own droplet in its own server that you can manage its resources separately so i i think it the the ui for this stuff is really nice and it ends up being really a good experience a much better experience than i was expecting from free open source software that is you know doing so much this is like a, a really cool project um next one is cap rover cap rover this one seems really nice uh I don't have much to say on it because I haven't tried it, but it does seem obviously the UI, if you click on it, it's a little less, a little less pretty, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't disqualify anything. It, it does all the stuff you want it to do. It gives you going with a, um, a SSL for, for free and easy, gives you Docker swarm, um, gives you a G a, a GUI, lets you do one click to install a bunch of stuff. And it is, it's basically saying, Hey man, uh, we know this stuff can get expensive, so we're going to make it really easy for you to host your stuff. I found Cap Rover to be fine. It's not the one I used for my my experience, but based on their docs, it seems like a decent option. Uh, yep. Doku is one that I saw when people were talking about Coolify or any of these. There's yeah. all Do, Doku was the web storm of these, where there's always one person being like, "You got to use Doku. Yeah. Doku's the one." Uh, I I installed this. Do you want to you installed this on on what? Yeah, a, a, probably two years ago. I went through this whole. Uh, these services are are getting expensive. I wish that there was some sort of self hosted Heroku or self hosted whatever. And uh, what's interesting about 
Railway and Heroku and DigitalOcean app platform is they all use these things called app packs, which are just descriptions of how to set up a um, how to set up a server. Now, Heroku has made all of their sort of images open source, and different services can actually use them. And Doku uses those app packs, and uh, I thought it was pretty cool at the time. I just I just kept hitting like little like config errors and whatever, and I just I. Just, said screw it after about four hours of trying to get it run so it's probably better now yeah and there's also one you'll see nix packs a lot nix packs yes Um, that's like the new version of the heroku app packs yes and so nix pack you know that that's kind of what it does and you can use nix packs with most of these or whatever the docker config for these is I'm a GUI kind of guy. So for me, I'm like, I'm typing in my, my text boxes and hitting save. I know that is going to, you know, not be the way that many of you like to work and you like your packs and stuff like that. And that's cool. Very usable. Uh, it might be something I eventually get into here. Who knows? I'm going down a, a slippery slope of hosting my own stuff. Next thing you know, I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be actually knowing what to do with Kubernetes. So uh, Doku is a CLI based. If you would like a UI for your Doku instance, I guess you would call it, for your Doku, yeah. you have to pay $849 for a license. So if you like a, a UI, Doku's probably not for you. But if you're the type of person who likes to do things through a CLI, it, it is very Heroku-like in that sort of way. I think it's a good option. It it's, it seems like it's very well-liked. The people who, who like it seem to uh, like it. I do. Like I said, I like to see those UIs and things. Uh, but it does seem to make it really easy to not just do the general stuff that you want to do, but um, to do some fancy stuff as well. So, you know, give Doku a try. I think it's a well-liked. Did you look into Ludoku at all? Ledoku. Ledoku. So because Doku, it's probably Doku if if we're thinking about it, because it's Docker, right? Yeah. Um maybe. Yeah. Like of of course there's a CLI and there's APIs for interacting with it. So it looks like somebody wrote a uh it hasn't been updated in two years. I don't know if it's it's any good or not, but uh someone else wrote another UI for for Doku. It's, it mm. makes sense that they would charge 850 bucks because for like an, a business that's spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars on servers, uh, like a, a little skin to throw on and to click on their things, like the 850 bucks is nothing to a lot of companies. But if you're an indie maker, that's, that's a big uh, chunk of change. Especially if the point of doing this is to save money. That's exactly. I, I think if you're the type of person who is getting deeper into this stuff and wants the most out of it doku seems like a great option it does support arm 64 and the reason why i'm saying that is because piku is the next one and piku was inspired by doku as a means of supporting arm 64 to run specifically on a raspberry pi cluster so this one seems like it might be a little bit more hobbyist project type of situation you want to throw something up onto your local Raspberry Pi or perhaps a Pi cluster. Seems like Piku is designed for that and is Doku-like. Again, I haven't used it. It is CLI-based. There is no UI for it. Uh, Kuber or Kuber, um, Kuber Kuber.cloud or Kuber.cloud. I guess it could be Kuber, but it's with a C, Kuber.cloud. Deploy your apps on Kubernetes easily. It has no UI as far as I could tell, uh, config-based. You might not need to know Kubernetes, I have as a note, but it feels like you might. <laughs> and I say this because <laughs> I have not tried Kuber Cloud. I, you know, I, I didn't want to get too deep into Kubernetes. I wanted to know what it was. I wanted to get myself up and running, and I didn't want to turn this into a, oh boy, we're going to have to like really get deep into the weeds. But Kuber Cloud does look kind of nice. That said, the configuration does scare me a little bit. It does seem like the feature set for this thing is really good. And last but not least is Acorn. Acorn has a pretty website, but is a CLI based. There is no UI for it again. And their docs show you getting up and running with Python. You know, it, it 
it doesn't feel like the option that most people who are like just looking for a Netlify alternative will want to pick. So some of these, whether it is Kuber, Acorn, Doku, Kubero, some of these feel like they might be for the more intense use case rather than Coolify, which seems like, oh, hey, I want to just get what I had going with uh, Renderer.com going on my own DigitalOcean droplet. So if that's the type of person you are, which matches the type of person I am, you'll probably just say, hey, Coolify works for me. It's easy to get going, easy to install, works everywhere, and uh, is is pretty effortless. Sweet. Yeah, I'm going to try to throw this on my my NAS. And I'm tr- trying to look at how to do it though, because like it's not a Docker image because it it can make Docker images, right? Uh, it, well, we should have the creator of Coolify on here to talk yeah. a little bit. He's been uh, he and I've been chatting a bit on Twitter, and he's a really cool guy, and he really seems to love this project that he's working on. So I wonder if there's like a VM image I can install because I hit that with Home Assistant as well as I initially installed Home Assistant as a Docker image, but a lot of the good Home Assistant plugins are in themselves Docker images, and you can't run a Docker in a Docker. So I had to switch my Home Assistant to running as a VM, and then the VM can then spawn many Docker images. Yeah. What a world. What a world. I'm going to go back to my variables in JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and, and if you're out there, you know, you are an expert in this type of thing, or you have m- more questions, reach out to us. By by all accounts, I'm a hobbyist who just started experimenting with this stuff, and Wes has not used it. So this is what I have found. If you have contradictory information or have found better or different things, hit us up anywhere. We're we're happy to to have that discussion. In fact, we're going to be having David Flanagan on, who does a lot of Kubernetes. I mean, that's like his thing. And ooh, if you have any questions about this stuff, by all means, let us know, and we'll try to get those in front of David, somebody who's actually an expert in this area that we can really ask all the questions to. So again, the challenges here with hosting your own pass platform as a service, getting things like high availability, you know, that you could get just by hucking some cash at a, a render server or something. These things do require Kubernetes knowledge or one of these more intense services or getting into Docker Swarm. I don't even know what the higher availability picture is for Docker Storm or Swarm. I, d- I have no idea. I have not looked into it. So it's not as just as easy as logging in and clicking a button oftentimes. You might have to learn a little bit about Docker and Kubernetes. That is a concern. I have not had to get there yet, but I can see getting my foot in the door into this space as being like, yeah, you might potentially have to learn some of this stuff, at least to a little bit. You have to keep your server up to date still, you know, I don't know. Things have exploits. Linux has exploits or whatever comes up, whatever you're running your, you you still got to keep this stuff, stuff up to date. Yeah. Remember, remember heartbeat? Yes. What was that? Five, six years ago, heartbeat came out. And at the time, a lot of people were still managing their own NGINX. So we all had to figure out how to be sysadmins and, Go up, update our servers, and that's always kind of scary, too. Updating so. anything with the database, definitely scary. And another thing is, like, if you want to run things on the edge, this is not for you, you know. Um, this is tossing up side projects. This is potentially hosting your own cache servers or stuff Running like that. Running on the edge of your bed, more like it. Yeah, I don't, I don't get Under that, your what you're trying to say there. Okay. Oh, like... <laughs> It's not like the opposite of the edge, which is high availability running in data centers close to the user. The opposite of that is a PC underneath your desk mm. or uh, on sitting on your a laptop, sitting on your bed that's serving yes. it out to the world. <laughs> yes. Do not close this laptop. It runs the entire company. <laughs> well, that's apparently uh, just like a funny story is uh, GitHub Pages runs. Yes. What's the the Ruby based thing that that runs on GitHub Pages? If you want to have like a site builder, um, on GitHub Pages, Jekyll. So GitHub Pages, you can obviously host just HTML, but they also support this thing called Jekyll, which will is a static site builder and it will build the website for you. Um, apparently, Jekyll was running on just like a PC under someone's desk, 
far into uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that actually came from when we had the folks from GitHub on that story. I thought that was mm -hmm. really interesting that like it became a very popular feature uh, all while just running on a PC in somebody somebody's desk. And that's a good lesson. You don't yeah. always need <laughs> the serverless function or whatever that people are talking about as being the thing you need. Sometime you just straight up need a node server and that's yep. good enough. Let me tell you, the, the the app that I have running on my Coolify server loads in 50 milliseconds. <laughs> and uh, that's pretty dang fast, okay? So, you know, people talk about you need this, you need that. Hey, you, you don't always need this and that. Sometimes you just need what works, right? So uh, my final thoughts, I tried Coolify. I liked it. It was easy to get up and running. I'm going to continue to host stuff there. I may move it off of DigitalOcean because I'm a salty salty man i one one more thing i'm just you've been talking about this i didn't even realize like servers could run arm 64 like i realized it but i didn't realize it was so readily available because it's not that ready available is the problem oh it's just starting to pop up um it because like they're, like they're yeah. in lots of cases they're faster at running things like uh and with all these like ai models starting to come out where people are trying to we have a show coming up on running ai models locally mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting because like you're not going to throw that on a serverless function because sometimes it takes like three minutes to to process and run you need a long run and running service for that right and i'd be interested to see if people are like okay well we want to run it ourselves but we need to deploy it somewhere. So yeah. maybe this type of thing is going to become more popular. And you know what? Some of these uh, services out there that offer ARM servers, so like one of them is Scaleway. Scaleway specifically advertises it itself as uh, scale AI models. <laughs> so oh. it's basically like saying, hey, our servers are good for running AI in the cloud. And they, they have arm 64 servers now one thing that i've noticed is that most of these are based in europe and I, what i haven't found is i haven't found a good solution in the arm space that hosts or has um u.s based servers hetzner has it um what i what was the one i just said the um scaleways scaleways another one i've been suggested is rack nerd although i haven't looked at them at all so I have no idea. A lot of these places do offer servers in the U.S., but not ARM servers. And I wonder why that is. Interesting. I wonder if Coolify works with like just straight up AWS EC2. Uh, AWS EC2 is their server full offering. Let me double check that, actually. How to just... deploy Coolify on AWS with pre-configured EC2, yeah. So it is EC2, okay. Let's see. I mean, let me confirm here. Con Pre-configured AMI. I don't know what AMI is. If you can get it running on EC2, like that might be the cheapest way. Generally, Amazon is the cheapest, mm -hmm. but people don't necessarily gravitate to it because it is the most painful to, to set up, which is, <laughs> we've asked this question many times and we've had many different uh, flight control on SST, it's just like, why does Amazon not build a Vercel, you know? And if, the, if they would put out every single company out of business that is existing in this space that just sits on top of a, a AWS yeah. as a wrapper. And everyone's going to say, Wes, that's what Amplify is. Meh. Yeah. If, if Amplify was like as it. good as Vercel, Vercel would not be in business, right? There's a reason we all use, Syndax uses Vercel. I use it for a lot of my projects. It's really good. People, there's a reason we pay up to use it. It's because it just works and it's awesome. I will say though, it's not without its problems. I mean, we had situations, be, we've had situations because running serverless, obviously. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, in in running on Vercel specifically, that you wouldn't happen if you were just running a node server. And it's like, well, do we actually need to be running serverless? Is that really solving the problems for us? If one, we're still paying out the butt for it and it's you know because it's not like for sales cheap no no it's it's not cheap so yeah it really depends we were having issues with the um it was not finding the files in the svelte kit adapter um, we had some wasm files that were not referenced anywhere 
And the package we were using just assumed that the WASM file would be beside it. But the way that Vercel bundles things is if it doesn't know that a file exists via the require tree, it doesn't include it in the actual serverless bundle. And we could not for the life of us figure out. It looks like SvelteKit, I saw something come over GitHub. The SvelteKit adapter has has fixed that. So we need to try it just yet. But right now we wrote a, if you go into the syntax repo, there's a file called why do I need this.js? And oh, it just yeah. copy and pastes the files into the serverless functions before we deploy. <laughs> I'm just here so I don't get fired. JS. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 let me tell you something actually really interesting too before we, we move off of this, this topic, Wes. I, like many other people, have been working in bun or alternative runtimes. And yep. you get to the situation where you're like, does not let I support bun? Does render support bun? And you're at, you're at, you're beholden to, the hosting platform if they support these types of things. Let me tell you, here's how I got Bun working on Coolify. Oh. I pointed it to my repo. The words you're uh, saying right now, sorry. <laughs> you got they, Bun working on I, Coolify. Continue. <laughs> I, got, I got Bun. It's working on Coolify. And uh, <laughs> let me just tell you, all I had to do was to say, bun install whatever and coolify picked it up and automatically installed bun on the system for me so i didn't wow. even have to install bun i didn't even have to tell it to install bun it installed bun so yeah i got i got bun running with with no no fuss no mess so yeah i, I i'm pretty sure coolify has an extension called if you ain't got buns hun then if it just installs it yeah that's what it is if you ain't got buns hun <laughs> perfect last <laughs> <laughs> no notes. <laughs> oh, all right. I think that's it. This I'm I'm really excited about this. I kind of want to try spin up a a little instance of it. And we should say also, like people are always like, "Oh, you're you're so cheap and whatever." We get for sale for free. I get I got unlimited Netlify account. I can host everything for free for the rest of my life uh, if I wanted. The reason why we talk about this type of stuff is not because I don't want to pay twenty bucks a month. These companies give us free hosting, you know, but the reason we talk about it is because it's, it's really interesting. And we do think about everyone who's listening to this type of thing. And it, it's important that we all learn to, to host our own servers if we want to throw projects up for free. Yeah. And you might be out there hosting 15 WordPress sites for clients at X amount of bucks a pop when you could be using a service like this to do it much easier for you. So, I mean, it's, it, there's definitely a lot of situations where I, I think pe developers get into this mode where, Hey, I'm building this. So everybody must be building this when in reality, we're all working on different kinds of stuff and different, different types of projects. And I think it's important to realize, Hey, if, if it's not viable for you, that's okay. I just had the same discussion on, on Twitter. In fact, I had to stop talking on Twitter because people are, are wild about HTMX. We're like, I don't know. There's so many people that get so insecure about other tools. Like, bro, you don't have to use it. Nobody's telling you to use it. I'm just exploring this thing or talking about these ideas. It doesn't mean that all of a the sudden these, I don't know. I, I asked what types of interactive things are you doing? And people had the wildest replies. They'd be like, I need time travel debugging. All right. What do you need that for? Oh, well, I need it. That actually is okay. really handy. Yeah. <laughs> I know it is. I know it's really handy, but it's only really handy when you're dealing with a lot of data yeah. or perhaps you're building something that needs actual undo functionality. Uh, <laughs> it's funny that you say that because I was, before you joined, I was talking to Randy about the the Apple episode and people let us know their their opinions on, on Apple and, and the open web. And like, it's crazy that I was telling Randy how people get angry all the time at, at, at certain things. And if you talk about a certain piece of tech, that's not the way they do it then they get very angry. And it's, I think the, the biggest thing is that shows like an inexperienced developer is when someone cannot possibly foresee that people have different problems than they yes. have. Yeah. They have different <laughs> stack setups than they have. Like some people would say, oh yeah, like you could just use like a meta framework for absolutely everything. And like, no, people have other, some people still need GraphQL APIs because they, they have many pieces of data coming in. Like there's so many different problems and so many different instances that need to be solved that you may not be even considering what that looks like. Yeah. 
I know. And I think if, if we had Dr. Uh, Talinsky on the show, I think she would diagnose it as just being insecure, right? These people see something they don't know that much about. They're going to lash out about it because uh, they don't they don't know why other people need it because they don't need it. Who knows? Yeah. Or or I, th- I also think that people think it makes them look smart when they're really opinionated about something. Yeah. Some people really love to argue on Twitter. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't smart. make you look smart. At least not to me, you know? Like maybe for for beginners it makes you look look really smart and we've I've said this many times before. It's like you often see beginners have lots of opinions on things because it it, it makes it makes them look like they they know what they're talking about, but in reality you just look like a jerk. A lot of times yeah. and that's it's fine to have opinions, but there's there's a there's a line there. Yeah, yeah, you got to stay open minded. Um, I, I posted a link to a a hacker news that was posted 19 days ago, which is oddly enough, and says ditching pass why I went back to self hosting. Now I found this not only did I find the blog to be interesting, but I found the I linked to the comment section specifically, there's a lot of discussion around cost actual cost what people are using and what they aren't. It's full of typical hacker news nonsense where people are again arguing about the things. But I did find the whole thing to be just an interesting read if this is something you have interest in. And again, we're going to have David Flanagan on the show who's an expert in in Kubernetes stuff. So if you have any questions about deeper things here, let us know. We will pass them along to David because I'm sure we're very curious too. We're going to pick his brain. So that's it for this episode. Let's get into sick picks and uh, shameless plugs. Wes, do you have any sick picks? You bet. I got a really good one for you today. And can I can I go run and get it, actually? You bet. Yes. Okay. One sec. Yeah, Absolutely. All right. I just ran all the way upstairs because it is a video podcast now and I want to be able to share what it is. And it is what is called a grip stick. You got to pull it back. It's too close to the camera. I got to be one of the makeup influencers. There we go. Uh, Grip. So a grip stick is. That doesn't sound right. The like this is a scene on TV. The best way to seal your chip bags or. pancake mix or any any sort of plastic or cellophane bag and the way that it works is that you just fold it over chest what are these chester's corn twists chester's corn twists what yeah. is that i don't know i don't even know <laughs> do, do you have this guy though they're like oh yeah the we have chester guy? cheeto yeah we have chester cheeto but he's just like the cheetos guy he's oh, occasionally yeah. like uh kind of delinquent in commercials <laughs> Yeah, he's 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 kind of a yeah, he's definitely a delinquent. I would I would say that's it. But the way that it works is chip clips. I hate chip clips. You know, you you put the clip on, it falls off or whatever. Pain in the butt. So these things are called a grip stick and you basically just make a a little um crease and then zoop and then it's airtight. Like I feel like I, I might quit my job and be like a, a salesman for this type of thing because it's so nice. And you can get a pack and like my kid had some cookies in their lunch and they didn't eat the whole pack. So what I did is I just grabbed it and threw a little one on this morning. And it's like, I, I can't believe how awesome they are. And you can, I got them on AliExpress. It's like $2 for a pack of like eight or something like that. Super cheap. And it just keeps your food super fresh and i've just been like my wife is so sick of me showing her new things that i can grip stick she's like i get it they're they're nice clips it's not that exciting but i was like scott will care i'll show scott (laughs) and you know what Wes? there uh, you know i've already opened the browser and started searching for them um so yeah i care and i (laughs) Yeah, not only do I care, I'm going to order some, and I definitely see the utility. I've always wondered to myself with chip clips, what are these doing besides making the stuff not fall out of the bag when you pick yeah. it up? Like, they're not keeping it fresh just by folding over the bag. Or, you know, my, my, it's not any better than just crinkling it up and rolling it up. It just, man, what a, what a nice little thing there you got there. Yeah, 
big fan yeah. of this. Well, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily have anything super interesting, but you know, I will sick pick something that I, I have all over my house now that I've been, I probably sick pick this at least once before. And sometimes we do repeat sick picks, but I, I have been slowly, but surely changing all of my light switches to be the Caseta. I have the, the diva, which is the one with the dimmer and then the Claro, which is just the normal smart switch or there's the accessory switch. I've been putting these things all over my house slowly but surely because they are expensive so i'll buy one or two at a time install it i still have maybe i still probably have a third of the house to do still but i love these smart switches opposed to like i've used smart bulbs in the past whatever but i have my home assistant i have routine set up my wife hates it because it shuts off the lights at the kitchen table at eight o'clock when she's sitting at the <laughs> kitchen table sometimes uh, but I gotta say, um, having the dimmer everywhere, having these smart routines, it it doesn't get any better. And the software is fast; it's efficient. The biggest downside with any of these Casetas, anything, is is the price. So again, slowly but surely, or if, if you're doing a whole bunch at once and you have the cash to spend on it, I have found as far as all smart light switches go, the Casetas really do seem to be the best. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of those ones as well. I have I probably have like eight different kinds of light switches because I've tried them all, and uh, by far the worst ones are the Wise, unfortunately, which kills me because I love Wise as a company, but they always always lose Wi-Fi, and I have a commercial level Wi-Fi setup at our house, so it's not a <laughs> yeah, Wi-Fi. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, don't get the wise ones. Sick. Well, shameless plugs. I'm going to shamelessly plug the Syntax YouTube. We're posting We're posting quite frequently, and we're going to continue to post there. I'm going to be putting out later today, it'll be very live by the time you hear this, a video on what it's like to code with the Vision Pro on. So Ooh, if you're yeah. interested in, in VR and coding, I have been using it daily. I did not want to take it off last night um, well, I, or yesterday. All day at work, I was coding with it on except for... When uh, Randy and I had our meeting, I took it off for that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, sh I'll shamelessly plug the Syntax YouTube channel. Check it out. S just go to YouTube, type in Syntax Podcast, or s I think it's, that's the it's best YouTube. way to find it. Com, YouTube.com forward slash at Syntax FM. They have a new URL style structure. They change this all around. It's at syntax fm rather okay. than forward slash channel forward slash u c y whatever oh, yeah <laughs> yeah that's good although like search it i think that helps I, I was seeing how mr beast doesn't link any of his youtube things anymore because apparently oh, i don't know the, oh, these man, like the algo people oh, come talking on. about the algorithm but We're apparently people's experience worse going by... to search it i know it's so mm. frustrating freaking algorithm Hey, but while you're there, smash that like button, ring the bell, click thumbs up on all the videos, and tell Wes and I that we both look handsome in the comments. We would all love that. Tell Thank us you. who's handsomer, though. All right. Well, you don't Thanks need to because we already know. <laughs> Catch you later. <laughs> Peace. Peace.